everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and I'm joined tonight by two of my very special co-hosts that are sitting next to me. Hello, Rob. It's me to your left, Diana. And it's me to your also left, Jackie. But not to my left. Technically, I guess you guys are in front of me, but you're not really in front of me because you're West. far away <laughs> over the interwebs. But we have two extra special additional co-hosts tonight. So special co-hosts, please introduce yourselves. Sure. My name is Clint Evans. I am a BCBA, just like the fine folks on this podcast. And I am the founder proprietary engineer. I don't know what you want to call me. I'm the weird guy that created the behavior chef. And then the dude that's coming up next is the guy that's going to help me with it. Yeah. I am Tony Chambers. I'm also a BCBA here in St. Louis. And I was brought on by Clint to help co-found the behavior chef. And we'll get into our different parts as we dive in today. That's Beautiful. Right. So we've got Tony here from The Behavior Chef. Thank you, guys. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah, it's so great you could be here. So I, I guess people excited. listening probably want to know what we do here. So we're BCBAs, which hopefully you are too if you're listening to this. Though I guess you don't have to be. But this is a podcast about behavior analysis and I behavior analysis. I wasn't when I found research. you. Yeah, oh, you that's are? true. I, I, you, you helped me study. So <laughs> that kind of makes me feel so old though. Clint. I know <laughs> I, I, you never know how to say it. You know what? We're it's, your age, Clint. We're your age. <laughs> when I was a boy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the guests that you had. And now it's really cool to see when I was a student studying a few years ago. Now I get to be a guest and selfishly, I think that's awesome. Oh, cool. good. Well, that's yeah, always nice to here. have you. Yeah. We're very glad to hear you guys. So every week we talk about a different topic. And if it's a topic that we're not so familiar with, we, we see, is there anyone out in the field who can tell us more? And our topic is promoting healthful, and we said healthful rather than healthy, but healthful behavior. And so we thought, what better guys than the two guys who are running a podcast that is pretty much on the topic of healthy behavior. So why don't you start by telling us about the behavior chef itself? Sure. Shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> so the behavior chef was a genesis out of a personal journey of mine. So I've been what we professionally call a yo-yo dieter for my entire life, mm -hmm. not just adult life, but you know, going into sports and everything. It was always that way. I'd gain weight in an off season for football, lose it with conditioning, you know, when metabolisms were good. And then college happened and Taco Bell was bay. And, you know, I just stopped doing all the things and uh, I got married and I got really happy. And by really happy, I also got really fat and that's the personal definition. So anybody listening, uh, you know, that's, that's up to you, what you consider, I respect that. But, but by my definition, my clothes were getting tighter and I was blaming the dryer. So not the burrito. My wife, so do I. Not the burritos. No, I was becoming a burrito. That's the thing. So <laughs> I got up to close to 360 pounds, somewhere in the 350 range and my wife and I paid a bunch of money to people that did something similar to ABA with uh, nutritional coaching and stuff like that. And then we ended up losing some weight and I've continued, you know, I've got a little bit left to go, but that's a journey that we're all on, you know, for our own healthful, coin the phrase, our own healthful behaviors. So I decided it was almost, it's almost a year old now. So a year ago on Valentine's day, actually, oh. I went out to dinner with my wife and we went out to this really nice old like mansion that was converted into a restaurant, really like candlelight dinner. And, you know, it was decadent and indulgent. And we Jealous. Got <laughs> it was awesome. But you know, if you got a good person in your life, they deserve to be pampered. So, you know, anybody listening, there's some good non-contingent reinforcement for you for your <laughs> significant other and spoil them because they deserve it. They put up with you. At least that's what happens in my household. <laughs> my wife deserves it. But we, you know, we got out for dinner. We came back and I, I'd been thinking so much about ABA and what like the application outside of ASD and DD and, and education. Because we always say ABA, you know, we have the moniker ABA can save the world. We have the moniker that everybody does behavior, quote unquote. So all these things, I'm like, okay, we are. And I'm seeing the health, sports and fitness SIG. I was a part of that. So I was like, I'm interested. And I noticed that there was absolutely, well, I'm not say absolutely nothing, but in my, it, it took me a minute to find something that was related to nutrition. Everybody's pushing, you know, go to the gym more. We, how can behavior analysis help in incremental changes? I think last year was when Dr. Jim Moore did the presentation ABAI on teaching using, I think it was forward chaining for yeah. uh, yep. U.S. Olympic lifters. Yeah, I was yep. at that symposium or his, his, his uh, spiel last year was awesome. 
So I saw that and I was like, it's like, it's got to, we have to do something. So I, I just put my foot in the door. That's all I did. I, I created a Facebook page titled The Behavior Chef, posted it to all the behavioral groups I was in that I could find. It, I was just doing a podcast earlier with another group. And I said, if you go back and, and look at my first like cover art, it was literally like clip art of an apron and a data point. And it said <laughs> The Behavior Chef and like really fancy, like Lucidia cursive. You know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty legit. But I woke up the next morning to email from Matt Sicoria and Todd Ward. And both of them were, you know, like I was brand new. I've been to BCBA going, this is my second year cycle. So I'm, I'm still pretty fresh. And I was freaking out. It's like, you know, Matt Sicoria, Todd Ward, these guys I know about, I've seen what they yeah. do. They're like, hey, we want to talk to you about your thing, like independently. And, I, and Matt goes, what, what is this? And I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just saw a hole and I, I, I wanted to put my foot in the door before somebody else jumped in. So now here we are a year later, you know, we have the podcast that I do. I'll talk about a little bit. We focus on, we're ABA light, if you will. You know, we want that dem- dissemination piece. So we, I, I bring in, uh, Well, oh, you're heavy that, on the applied. Let's say that way. Yeah, yeah no, I, I like That's that. Fun. Yeah. I like that a lot. Uh, I call it coffee shop ABA, you know, where we use ABA terminology and then I, I will explain it in real world terms for those listening that hopefully there's more people that don't know what ABA is than, mm-hmm. than that are. Cause I want to get, you know, I want to show those boundaries. Mm-hmm. So we have guests like I've, um, I've had a personal trainer. I've had a registered dietitian. I've had Stephen Hayes to talk about ACT. I've had Dr. Jim Moore who was on Laura Cyberling. She's written a great book with a, uh, another uh, colleague called the Behavior or, uh, Broccoli Bootcamp. And it was about, you know, feeding issues. So we talk about a, a wide variety of things with people that are way smarter than me. So I get to learn as I go and it's really cool. But then we have the Behavior Analyst Get Fed group, which is very cool because we're about at 2,000 members and it's only for ABA practitioners. So that, that opens it up a little bit, but it's specifically a safe space, if you will, for those of us in the field to discuss nutrition, nutrition related issues as, you know, I know it's difficult to run from house to house or school to school and actually eat a nutritious lunch. Mm. So we, yeah. every once in a while, we'll do some inner group contingencies to kind of just boost morale and things like that. We're actually getting ready to do another one soon. So if you're listening and you're not in the group and you're interested, come on over, check it out. That's where I kind of come in. And now Tony is doing something completely different. And there is, I can promise you, there is absolutely nothing out there like what Tony's doing. So I'm going to build you up, brother. Spring off that springboard and tell him what you're doing. Hey, no pressure. Thanks, bud. <laughs> no, uh, it's exciting. Clint and I worked together. That's how we came to be acquaintances and got to know each other. And I was coming out of a local large box grocery store when he called me and said, um, I did something. I said, oh boy, Clint, what did you do? And he said, um, I started this thing called the Behavior Chef like two days ago. And I won't repeat the story, but he walked me through exactly what he told you guys. And he's like, you know, there's a large piece to nutrition that I need help with. And that's the cooking side. And he knows I'm extremely passionate home cook. And uh, I wish you lived with me, Tony. (laughs) You can come over anytime. I mean, I might be able to mail you some stuff. (laughs) Done. It's there. Done. And I I couldn't say yes fast enough. I, I have a tendency to turn a lot of my hobbies into jobs, but this is one that just felt right. And he's like, just what do you want to do? Give me ideas. Here's the vision of Behavior Chef. Go. So we talked for a long time and we decided that I'd head up just kind of cooking operations. If if we'll go ahead and define it here, Clint. Um, I like that. I like yeah. your operational definition of cooking operations. Just CO, not CO, anything else. Just cooking <laughs> operations. So... We decided to start putting a YouTube show together. Clint would head up a podcast. I would I would head up a YouTube show and some sort of food and cooking show. And we talked about it for a long time. We went through, I don't know how many renditions of this show we've talked about. And we're just now finally kind of landing on a really good format where we can blend applied behavior analysis in an extremely friendly way to give people a different perspective on how to cook, how to set up their environment to cook, and kind of push our science into that realm. And what does that even look like? There aren't any other examples that I've been able to find out there specifically, but really the big vision is to make it friendly for everybody. Because again, the applied piece, just to make the general public be able to watch our show and say, okay, here's another 
one millionth cooking show that's out on YouTube, what makes this <laughs> one so special and different. But what I hope is the same thing that I felt when I first started cooking, and I can give you that, a little snippet of that story in a minute, is that I want them to watch that and go, oh, I can do that. That's presented to me in a way that makes sense. And it's a different perspective. And I learned maybe one or two new words and I'm going to go try that. And hopefully not only do you walk away with maybe a recipe I used on the show, but you're like, oh, well, I can use it on that recipe and I can make it immediately generalize it across a bunch of different meals for their, for their families. So I was a so awesome. Dad. Yeah. I was a single dad at one point with my oldest. I have a 16 year old and there was a point in our lives where I was working 60 hours a week. He lived at kind of daycares and babysitters. And at one point I was kind of in a grocery store parking lot one night. He was hungry. I had like five bucks to my name and didn't know if, you know, I was like, well, I can get him some food. I don't want to go through another drive through. He doesn't need another can of SpaghettiOs. And I just kind of got inspired because only like a night or two before I was up, couldn't go to sleep, watching late night food TV. It was uh, Alton Brown's Good Eats. Oh, that's good. I love that show. Yeah. Uh, I've only seen every episode a hundred times. <laughs> and I just remembered something that he did. It was so simple. It was a roasted chicken. And I went into the store and with five bucks, I got a lemon, a box of instant mashed potatoes and some chicken legs. And I managed to get all that, went home, cooked it, felt like we ate like kings that night for something that was so simple and so easy to do and fell, fell in love with cooking. Like, I can do this at home. I can do this. And through his show and through kind of the motivation in that moment, I was like, yeah, I can do this. And I want people to walk away with the same feeling and being able to utilize our science and put my passion towards that. Excellent. Well, Tony, that sounds very much in line with one of the articles that we're going to be discussing tonight yes. in terms of how can we make it easier? You know, there's got to be a better way. What a yes. coincidence. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> hmm. Yes. So, I'm excited about this article. Beautiful. So before we get into our articles, let's share with the listeners what we'll be talking about tonight. And so the first article, well, I think that kind of centers around the main points we're going to make, and then we'll get into more detail, is called Healthy Eating, Approaching the Selection, Preparation, and Consumption of Healthy Food as Choice Behavior. And that's by Rafaz from Perspectives on Behavior Science 2019. And then we also, and this is why it's healthful behavior, not just, you know, better eating practices. We'll be talking about two other articles, and they are on the idea of contingency management. So there's Internet-based contingency management increases walking in sedentary adults by Curti and Dallary, and that's from Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2013. And then in Drug and Alcohol Dependence 2011, there's Internet-based group contingency management to promote abstinence from cigarette smoking, a feasibility study by Meredith Grabinski and Dallary. I don't think I noticed Grabinski there. That's a good last name. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so those will be our articles that we'll be discussing tonight. And... I think the Rafaz article, when we're looking at the idea of healthful behavior, really gets to the crux of the matter as that choice. We're talking about choice. None of us are waking up and saying, you know what? I think it's just McDonald's for me. That's all I ever want to eat. I would love to get my cholesterol as high as possible. And I'd like to, you know, just have my arteries stop completely. That's, that's the plan. Only uh, if you're that guy that made that documentary. Oh, the Super yes. Size Me guy? Super yeah. Size Me, yeah. Classic. Just that guy. Nobody <laughs> <Morgan> else. Spurlock. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks, Rob. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, I loved this article because the author points out so many of the factors that are involved and so many of the components that are involved in healthful eating, which is not just the end product of eating. There mm. are many, many, many choices all along the way, which I'm sure is what you were just about to say. It is. How did you know? It's like you read my uh, list of questions. <laughs> I think let's just start by talking about healthful behavior and, and making healthy choices as a behavior itself. So let's kind of discuss that. You guys thought of these articles for us. Yeah, so why no don't you? <laughs> I'll start with this article because I ran across this article a few weeks ago. And I'll be uh, brutally honest, I, I ran across the abstract and and I was so excited to get into it and I couldn't wait to find it. So I just emailed, I just emailed her mm -hmm. and I said, Hey, I, I love, I love what you're thinking. You know, can you mind sharing your article with me? Let's, let's talk. And sure enough, within just a few hours, she emailed me back with a link. And then when I read this full article, I felt like, Oh, you're inside my brain or I'm inside <laughs> her brain. She beat me to the article, right? Because I'm kind of fascinated with this idea of selection and choices mm -hmm. because I think one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with behavior analysis and nutrition is the fact that this is not just one simple intervention. It's like there's not just one behavior you observe 
This is what they all, this is the contingency they always, you know, make contact with. So here's the consequence we're always going to get. Like it is extremely complex, which in the article, I'll go ahead and jump forward is they break, they kind of break down three components into selection, preparation, and consumption. And I think that's really smart because even when you break down those three components, they get complex within themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the selection piece, as you started, is yeah, you wake up in the morning. I'll use my daughter as an example. She's two. So as she's coming on the stairs, I prep breakfast every morning for the kids. I say, What do you want? And she'll say, Crunch bar. I'll put the crunch bar out and I'll go over to the cabinet and I'll open the cabinet. And then she sees the world of, you know, <laughs> our pantry. Is this like a, <laughs> Tony, is this like a Nestle crunch bar? No, it's a, it's like the Nature Valley Crunch Bar. Yeah. <laughs> just to the clarify. Ones that, yeah, just, <laughs> Thank that you. get crumbs even on top of the ceiling fan. Yeah. Somehow. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 those yeah. are quite amazing um, for that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so okay, happy. Okay, so not a chocolate for bar for breakfast. Okay. <laughs> no. We're like, we um, should go home now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I open up that pantry and then all of a sudden there are a hundred other yes. things to choose from, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, talk about choice and, and selection. Oh, well, now I want yogurt. And when we're talking about adults and our nutrition how we actually make those choices independently that we are trying to pull this apart and figure out how to, how to control that behavior. How, how right. do we, we, we talk, we start getting into function and determining does, how does function work into this? What, what are the environmental factors that, cause you can't just not keep anything in your pantry. Sure. And you can't just not drive by a McDonald's every day or get hungry at 11 o'clock at night. So I think that's a good place to start. I love the the separation too, because you can like selection and preparation. You could have all of the, you know, your wherewithal with the grocery store and select all of the healthy food. Mm-hmm. Right. But then yeah. choose to go out and not prepare it. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes yes. it's, it's so tiring to go to the grocery store. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> then by the time you get home with all the groceries, you're like, I can't cook this. I need to get takeout. I right? order something. Yeah. The, I mean, grocery pickup yes. now is a big thing uh, yes. at least here in St. Louis. And I utilize, I have four kids. So it's great to drive up to two grocery stores. They throw it in my trunk and I get to come home. That's a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is a lot of kids. I There's four more than I have. <laughs> You'll probably hear three of them here in about 15 minutes <laughs> um, going to bed. But yes, yeah, so when we start thinking about choices and what we're trying to come into, this is all extraordinarily new territory you know, for mm-hmm. us and even our science for... And this, this article, just to bring it back full circle, really starts to kind of break down some of those components that Clint and I are thinking about and diving into some of the like interventions and things that we can start thinking about. Yeah. And I think it makes more sense, you know, when we talk about, you know, healthful behavior, if we just talk about as healthful behavior versus unhealthful behavior, like there's only two options, you know, it's like a preference assessment. (laughs) It makes sense why basic interventions wouldn't work because we're not just saying, oh, well, I'm going to allocate my responding to the healthful behavior. And that's one thing. I just have to do the one thing. I have to, you know, press the button that says healthy living and then everything will sort of work out from there. I wish. Like in the Jetsons. Yes. (laughs) Like in the yes. I wish I wish it were that simple. Yeah, Everyone wishes it were that it simple. I think the the springboard from that, I think the beauty of that is it's the concept is very non behavior analytic. Mm-hmm. So it, it forces us to think less like a behavior analyst and more like a human. Mm-hmm. That makes any sense. So we obviously our our basis is ABA, and so we're looking at you know I think we've all heard the trope you know don't don't do anything cookie cutter, don't do anything cookie cutter. So, but ironically enough, you do it long enough, right? And the non cookie cutter things kind of become your cookie cutter. Okay. So how often am I going to use the DRL versus the DRA, right? I use a DRA for every single thing I do because it's simple. It's, you know, parsimonious is the easiest way to start something. No, yeah. DR, I, you know, I know and it's say, FCT most of the time, which yeah, is like yeah. that's, that's what really we should a, be doing. So, yeah, right. It's, it's FCT to get that FCR for the DRA. Yep. <laughs> there you go. That's your acronym moment right there. But, uh, what I love Please pause about to Google. Yeah, right. What I love about it, the reason why I, you know, started stumbling into it myself and looking into the other research is that those basic interventions, right? that we use, that we take for granted, like the continuous reinforcements, the shaping, the chaining, the, all that, that is effective in the behavior change for people that are non-analytic. So we're used to applying things primarily into an ASD or DD population. But when it comes to somebody who, you know, like Tony was talking about, 
So actually, I don't know which one of you guys said it, but it was perfectly put. Like, you know, I go get all these groceries and I go home and I don't want to cook them. Yeah, um, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. How well, how poignant is that for the, the typical human in general who has got a normal day, right? Because you, you can have these lofty thoughts of like, okay, I'm going to meal prep this week and I'm going to cook quinoa and do these salads and you know the stuff that you see these what quote unquote i hate this term but the fit fluencer people you sure. know, on, on yeah right it's a terrible term but it's out there it's it you know that's what's saturating the market that's what's socially viable right now is do this 12-week program look like this and the person who has been doing this quote unquote that looks like that has been doing that for 12 years but in 12 weeks you know so that's your that, that's your stimulus response type of thing so it's you know it's broken up by our terms. It's, it's not going to work. It doesn't compute. So, well, and that's mentioned in the article too, of, yeah. of alluded to, of just kind of the satiation of health. And, you know, they, they really get into, you can't think of healthy eating, health, healthy living, healthy wellness and as just one thing. No. Because we are bombarded by 7,000 different type of quote unquote diets or nutrition and wellness plans. And, you know, we... Even with that market, we can't change. So how do we as behavior analysts with our best efforts try to make sure that we stay research-based, stay within our scope and, and even begin research? Like to, to right. you know, where we start and who do we start this research with? Is it completely behavior analytic or do we do multidisciplinary research with clinics and, and doctors? So sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I found really interesting about about the initial Rafaz article is that idea of the healthful behavior and that we're talking yes. about these complex human chains. I think that's true about every healthful choice we're going sure. to make. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about cigarette abstinence. We're going to talk about, you know, getting up and walking around, you know, not, not <laughs> doing the, what's it, sitting is the new smoking, right? And, and, absolutely, and how it's, it's, they're all connected in terms of we're never just talking about that one change. It's just the one thing. I mean, for some folks, it might be, but for a lot mm-hmm. of people, it's going to be, well, what are the different pieces of the intervention that are going to be relevant? And at what step in the chain do we implement them? I think the mistake that often gets made is like, like we've been talking about that sense of it's this homogenous behavior, like, oh, you do the thing and that'll fix it. Or do the two things I do. Even, even I think when people are thinking about their multiple systems, they're not thinking about necessarily what are my multiple steps doing in which portion of the complex human behavior chain so much <laughs> as it's just a list of three things. You should just do them all and then magic happens. And, and that's just not, right. it's like clickbait, right? Folks. Like yes. look, you eat these 10 things and you'll be fit. Number seven will surprise you. <laughs> it's blueberries. <laughs> it's always blueberries. Yeah, if I just say blueberries, blueberries and oatmeal every morning, pumpkin. but why wouldn't I eat blueberries? And, 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 and cayenne pepper, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but who who's to say that I like blueberries and oatmeal? Right. Well, that's right, one of the right. problems. That is one of the problems. Well, it goes that's back to a comment better. you made, Rob, about preference. I mean, our eating behavior all day is just one giant preference assessment after another, mm-hmm. depending on that motivating operation in that moment, which again, adds another barrier for us to look at <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, how to work with people to work through that as well in a behavior analytic way. Mm-hmm. Mine Does that make you excited though? Eating schedules. Yeah, (laughs) but don't you like to wake up in the morning and think like wow it's a whole new day of eating (laughs) yes i do actually or in cooking yes i mean realistically you could take that approach to anything that we do like you know i mean for our kid i was like wow it's another day for a trial of you know discrete trial training or it's it's another day for us to try stimulus equivalents it's not so you know, that approach, I think, to borrow from ACT a little bit, when we start looking deeper than just the behaviors that we emit, we look to that values piece, like, what keeps me doing this every day? Obviously, when it comes to it, the primary reinforcer of a paycheck really helps you keep your life in order and take care of your family. But you didn't go through school. You didn't get PhDs, respectively. You didn't do research just for money. Hmm. What was the value in it for you? You want to help? It was people? learning, Clint. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you, can, learning. you can do that for free nowadays. So <laughs> I don't know about you, but my learning was expensive. <laughs> yeah, I know. But Ray Fass in the article brings it back around too. And we're saying like different foods may come with sort of inherently different reinforcing value for us, but you can make modifications to the reinforcing value of healthy food, depending yes. on how we might pair that, how you might reinforce you know, less preferred with more preferred food, looking at restrictions on food, et cetera. So she does make that point yeah. later yeah. on. And Rafez yeah. even alludes to even another article by Epstein that really dives into, you know, kind of changing our, our thinking about diets and wellness plans in the sense of 
not thinking about what we can eat and what that rule is, but how do we make these choices and why do we make these choices? Because all of a sudden, you know, that's how you can kind of get into that trap is you get these meal plans and they say, okay, you're going to eat this on Monday, this on Tuesday, this on Wednesday. And then on Tuesday afternoon, you eat a cookie because it's somebody's birthday at work and you feel like you've ruined everything. So you throw it all out the window. Because mm-hmm. you cook one bowl. But when you really dive into the, how do I do this diet, you know, from a selection and preparation point, you go back to, as Clint said, kind of that value piece of what wellness means to you. And, and it can mean more. So if you stick to your plan on Monday and stick to it on Tuesday and have a cookie and you're like, okay, well, I know how this affects me, but I know what my plan is. And you get right back on track and you keep going. It's a great perspective to kind of think about and, and how we're going to move forward with interventions later on. And, yeah. and both. Right. That. And we honestly, if we're working with our clients and they, you know, don't perform as planned for the intervention, we don't throw the intervention out the window usually. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. No, there's that. <laughs> We're like, that oh, component. time to make a new plan. Right. Right. Then. Right. right. So we should really analysis. think about that with us as well. Yeah. All, sure. In both of these examples, it's usually a procedural integrity issue. Yes. Yep. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. To jump off of, you know, what Tony was just saying. So it, the article really points to that skills too. It, 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 and I know he'll talk more about that as well, but the point he was making that made me think of one thing that we're doing or getting ready to, I should say, at the time of this recording in the get fed group that we've got. If I can, you know, steal a spotlight for just a second, we're going, we're, we're going to be doing a symposium ABI. Nice. Ooh, I know, right? <laughs> so we presented a poster at Moaba because it's like right around the corner for us. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Maggie Pavone, Linwood University is, I went to Linwood. So she was a mentor of mine. She still is. She's like a, an advisor to the, the behavior chef process. So we're really riding her coattails for a lot of things because we don't have any clout yet. So we're trying to borrow other people so we can give it back later on. And that's the most honest answer I can give you to how people get started is they borrow from people they know and then they give it back. Yeah. And Maggie has been such a supporter and, and been awesome. And, and Linda Wood is, is a great, you know, a, a, gr- a great place to go and learn just because of the well, environmental factors. You know, we talk about that. The environment they're creating is really inducive and, and conducive to learning and inclusion. But she's working on some of her stuff and we kind of like, we, we did it. I call it like the Senate floor. You know how they like staple a bill, the, a bill to, as a writer to a, like, there's this really big bill, but we want to get this passed and we're going to attach it. <laughs> That's kind of what we did. I mean, we did this really small couple of months in the summer. We did a group contingency, interdependent group contingency where people put a couple bucks into a GoFundMe account. And then, you know, we kept track of our eating behaviors and we got points per day and all this stuff. And we ended up, it was successful. And it was to increase eating more at home versus eating out or preparing food at home. So we're, we're doing a symposium on the 25th of May at ABAI. And, and it's, I don't know why we always have these really, really long names for these things. It can't be like, Hey, come see us at food selectivity <laughs> symposium. It's literally called everyone eats behavior analysis applied to eating and meal related behaviors. I guess it's not super long. It's just kind of wordy. Well, I heard uh, somewhere that including a colon in your title. We'll have more people pay attention to it. <laughs> anytime there's a colon involved, people are going to pay attention, regardless it of very in- fancy. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just saying, anytime there's a colon involved, if, if it's <laughs> in your health behavior or your writing behavior, <laughs> we're going to pay attention. Got it. <laughs> that was a little. I'm going to call you, it the value of the colon. Colon. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Next time you can have that one for free. <laughs> Written by somebody named Colin. That would yeah. be awesome. I'm playfully playing with the idea of calling it the Iron Behavior Chef. And oh. so, you know, we talked about purchasing the food, right? And going home and then just reinforcers everywhere. Bootleg reinforcement at the yin yang, all your stuff goes out the window. So you've lost all of your, your procedural integrity for yourself is gone. So one of the things I'm looking at doing is doing that interdependent contingency again, except this time it'll be with introducing a new ingredient per week. And so we would, we would use that ingredient in some way. And I'm not talking like, you know, you have to go out and buy like, you know, saffron and use, that, you know, some expensive exotic thing. We're talking like you eat berries. All right. Let's get you to use strawberries in three ways this week or to use, you know, blueberries and oatmeal. How many times, how many different ways can you do that? So we're kind of trying to look at that in our little vacuum of behavior analysis people. I'm excited. I don't have any results for it yet. We haven't started it. So when we have you guys on, 
the, the Hibber Chef podcast. You know, I'm, I'm sure we'll have results by then. So we can kind of pick it apart and you guys can tear us down oh, yeah. and tell us what oh. we want. <laughs> and, that kind of plays in, awesome. and that plays into the preparation piece it of, does. of the article, mm-hmm. which is probably my favorite piece of the article, a little biased because the cooking piece is that how many times have we wanted to start a wellness plan or health plan and we have these ingredients or this, you know, whether it's, you know, keto, paleo, gluten free, whatever. And you have all this new cool stuff and you're ready to be healthy and you get, you're standing at your stove and you're like, I don't know how to cook these things. Mm-hmm. Or, or you cook them and they're bad. Gra- <laughs> yeah. I remember grandma <laughs> boiling these things. So I guess I should boil them too. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you're eating boiled Brussels sprouts, you know, with nothing on them. And that's, you know, I'm gross. I'm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you I'm find out, out grandma grandma and say that's everything. probably not, you know, the world's favorite way to eat those. So yeah. well, Brussels sprouts can be really good, but they so have good. to be prepared really correctly. Yes. Really perfect good. assessment in and of itself. Absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying, do I like boiled? Do I like sauteed? Do I like oven fried? Do I like yeah. olive oil? Yeah, it's absolutely. roasted. So if anybody's listening and you don't like roasted Brussels sprouts, you're wrong. Right. Yeah. So sorry to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's collective. Yeah. There are five BCBAs here. We 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 all collectively agree. Yeah, but so that that kind of plays into that, which is you know where the behavior bites show comes in uh, and plays back to that just to kind of give give people a taste of that and see what kind of responses we get uh, you know we could hopefully not but you know it could be totally wrong on some assumptions that we have which is why we're excited to hopefully get in with some health clinics and stuff and start this research it's great having such a, a great wonderful group on on social media to help us to help us start this yeah and so i think we, we, we've kind of hit a little bit on the idea of preparation you know i think with sort of the response effort of preparation being a huge roadblock to a lot of folks. And I think the advent of the internet and how easy it is to have people model cooking behavior is certainly probably an intervention on its own. We've talked a little bit about the idea of consumption. You know, if something's going to taste bad, we're not going to eat it. And or we're less likely to eat it. We're less yep. likely to eat it. And right. The, the other big piece of consumption is serving sizes too, which is, mm-hmm. which is huge as well. I feel like they at are one often point huge. we did one of the articles they mentioned in here, the stimulus equivalents. Mm-hmm. Yes. Grab portion, bag. Which that was grab bag. Yeah. So grab it wasn't bag. one on gotcha. just eating, but it was on the stimulus using stimulus equivalents to improve portion size. I know that's yes. for me, one of the things that even when I got better at sort of that using calorie information, which again, even in the ref as article, it's like, eh, if you really care about that stuff, that might be useful as an intervention. If you don't care about calorie counting or dieting, it's right. irrelevant. But even when I look, I'd say, oh, okay, this is going to be 100 calories for one serving. And I got a bag of something. I'm like, I will think this bag is a serving. And then you right. later find out that this bag was 10 servings. <laughs> yeah, But, yeah. you know, the bag's easy. Big, yeah, I on my own it. health journey, the two biggest moments that I learned was the first one was obviously cooking. And then I could cook anything. I could even cook a lot of healthy foods, but I would eat four portions of it. And then... Um, <laughs> There was a, a program that I found that helped teach you portion size. And once I learned that, I mean, it was, it was a giant leap in my, in my health. And I lost an extra 25 pounds after that. I mean, mm-hmm. just by only focusing in on serving size. So yeah, that yeah. consumption piece is huge. And then the final one that's discussed, and, we, and we've sort of touched on a few times, is the idea of the selection, the selection of foods, and how do we go about that? And so we kind of mentioned the idea of the calories, and that may or may not be helpful, depending on the individual. I kind of like they discussed some of the visual information and sort of the idea of making healthy food sexy, you know, and, and having the spokesperson on the on the packaging telling like, ooh, roasted Brussels sprouts, or I guess they wouldn't be roasted in the bag. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can be roasted. <laughs> Can be roasted. Ooh, ooh these Brussels sprouts should be as hot as me, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I think that kind of goes to the idea when we're talking about selection of who is responsible for selecting the food we have. And you always wonder, like, why don't more people select healthy food? And some of it might be that, well, there's not a lot always denoting what's healthy food and there's a lot of information you know tony you were talking about the different diets out there i mean oh man depending on which one you're paying attention to you're going to get five or six different people telling you no no this is healthy or that's healthy even within the diets themselves right think about how many times over history if you're a nerd like me and actually know a little food history how many times eggs has come Mm -hmm. in and out of they're healthy they're not healthy they're healthy they're not healthy same with milk and and i'll a lot of other foods out there. You should sure. eat tons of fruits. Oh, wait, they're loaded with sugar. You shouldn't. I mean, so even within, well, diets within diets within diets change right. so often. I mean, for the everyday person, 
keeping up with with what is good and what's not. I mean, who knows what they're going to say about the ketogenic diet and you know, 30 years, even though it has a ton of research behind it, but the offshoots that have come off of that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of like, oh my gosh, they used to eat like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and think long term, short term, right? So like I know I actually just went to a health talk by a doctor and he was talking about different diets and he's like, short term, this is actually a great diet if you want to lose weight or if yes. you want to like improve energy. But long term, if you're over 35 and you're on this diet, you know, you're killing your heart and you're giving yourself huge high yes. cholesterol, right? Mm. So it's short term, it may be really great. Long term, it may be really bad, right? So you have Absolutely. to think about what's going to be, what's important for you in this moment. Right. And I think a lot of us might choose the short term reinforcers over long term delay discounting. You know, we've seen it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Delay discounting is difficult unless there's a values driven component. I think, and then I'm speaking personally here. I think for me, when I set a goal for myself dietarily, I don't know if that's a word, but it sounds cool. So we're going to go with it. Dietarily, when I set a goal for myself, it's both what are my short term objectifiable goals? You know, like I would in a treatment plan. And then what's, I guess, what's my, what's my one, two, three learning outcome? And then what's my long term overall? What do I want? So like for me, I'll give you my current one. I, I definitely don't mind sharing. I'm an open book by, uh, about a lot of things. Weight loss has been my, my major thing. I've been a yo-yo dieter forever. I'm finally not a yo-yo dieter for the last couple of years, but I'm also not losing the way I want to. So I'm kind of doing a anecdotal component analysis of sorts about what I'm taking in and taking, you know, looking at the macronutrients, micronutrients, all that nerdy stuff. But it's really helping fine tune me. And I've made a decision at the beginning of the year that there is a certain weight that I want to lose. But more than that, there's a body fat percentage that I want to lose because of the health benefits in the long term. So if those two are correlated, great. If I lose the body fat percentage and I lose more weight, awesome. If I lose the body fat percentage and I don't lose as much weight, awesome. Because that means I'm more in a healthy range. So my mm -hmm. value is, you know, I'm, I don't have children, but we're getting ready to have kids if, you know, if we're able to in the near future. So I would like to be looking long term. I don't want to be the, the, the guy that can't keep up with his toddler, mm. you know, and, and I don't want to be the guy that comes home from work exhausted and can't sit down with his kids for five minutes. I don't want to be the fat dad. That's just my personal opinion because I was on that track, man. I'd come home from work and take a nap just from work. Like I didn't have any other responsibility. I just come Sounds home and take a nap. Sounds great though. <laughs> it was, but it, it yeah. wasn't because it was for choice. Yeah. It yeah. was for lack of energy. So, right. you know, if it were like my choice, I had nothing to do. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take a nap. And that's not a big deal. Yeah. When I come home and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's 3.30 and I need to nap. I knew something there, like my health wise, overall healthful behaviors, if you will, was, mm -hmm. was off. So values driven for me is huge. And it, and it goes into our choices here we're talking about. So making those long-term objectives reachable. So my, my lifestyle changes, I'm kind of filing with, with Tony. I love cooking. I'm not as advanced as he is, but I'm, I'm learning <laughs> all of these things as I go. You know, I, I'm learning how to use cutlery. I'm learning how to keep a knife sharp. So it's like, you know, you, you learn as a kid, don't touch sharp things, but you learn as an adult, if you use any sort of knives to, if you're cooking from scratch and organic, then you're going to be cutting a lot of your own vegetables. Mm -hmm. So you need to learn knife skills. You need to learn how to do it. All these pivotal skills that are involved. But also you learn that if your instruments are dull, you're actually more at a disadvantage there. So if you don't keep a sharp knife, that's actually the danger mm -hmm. more than it is to keep a sharp knife yeah. and learn how to appropriately use the, the utensils you've got to help, you know, make that meal or whatever it might be. But all of those things play into your long term and short term objectives. I like finding new, really weird ingredients that I never thought existed. Like my favorite one that I show people, it freaks them out all the time is purple potatoes. I love oh, yeah. those things. I do love, love purple potatoes. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. You talked about, you know, we got to make food sexy. I think naturally they're gorgeous. They taste like a sweet <laughs> potato. I love sweet potatoes. They're full of antioxidants. So you're getting all these cool benefits and you eat something purple. Mm -hmm. right. that's, to me, that's just really cool. Like, is that, what did you, what filter did you put on that? There's no Instagram filter, baby. That is nature. <laughs> Clint, didn't somebody just send you a bag of like cricket snacks or something like that? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. So I, a guilty pleasure show is Shark Tank for my wife and I because mm. we love smut TV when it comes to people having bad ideas <laughs> and Shark Tank <laughs> is full of them. But we did invest in, um, so I love protein, protein sources. I work out a lot. So I want to diversify those. I'll save the health stuff out of it for you. I just, I want to do those for my own thing. So one of the sources that I've picked up recently is a cricket based protein and it's a protein powder made out of crickets. 
that these people have yeah. they like they raise <laughs> them and then they they basically turn them into a flower and then they mix that with like a bunch of vegan proteins with it's kind of weird because that's which seems funny, right? Because it's vegan, yep. but don't worry about the crickets. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't mess with the crickets. You know, so I was like, you know what? Let's give it a shot. If anything, what it's done for me is it's opened up me trying new things. Go figure. Learning pivotal behaviors has naturally. I've I've contacted those natural contingencies to be more curious, right? And so that behavior momentum naturally takes effect, and I'm like, you know what? That sounds kind of disgusting, but it also sounds kind of cool to say I tried that. Mm. So we bought some. It's not my favorite thing in the world. It tastes like. Protein. I mean, it doesn't, to me, it's more of the internal event than it is the, the actual like sensational event. It tastes great. It has a great flavor to it. I just know that I'm drinking bugs. <laughs> so in that regard, it's more of a mental hurdle, but it's kind of, it's kind of fun to be like, you know, what? I'm going to use that today instead of, you know, my whey protein isolate that I get. So instead of getting satiated on the one thing that's supposed to be helpful and healthy mm-hmm. for me, I've mm-hmm. got a couple of different flavors and a couple of different avenues mm-hmm. so I can keep that variance going and not lose my, my own behavioral momentum. Yeah. And I get to eat crickets. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I love Ray Fass's decision tree yes. that she yes. presents in mm-hmm. her article, right? So it's like at every point along the way uh, with the selection, the preparation, the consumption, we, there's going to be an option for a choice between taking the healthful route or the unhealthful route. And it, when you read through, it's just... It's really beautifully laid out, but you're like, oh gosh, like every step of the way, the healthful route is more effortful, right? So it's harder to get the ingredients that are better for you, or it's more expensive to get the ingredients that are better for you, or it takes more time to prepare the ingredients that are better for you. I think she says in there that, you know, calorically speaking, healthful food is much more expensive than unhealthful food. Mm -hmm. And that can be a real disadvantage for some people, right? So anything, like you're saying, Clint, that that could happen on the healthful side, that could open up more avenues for excitement, motivation, more options for reinforcers, and but hopefully more you know, less effortful options as well, sure. is mm-hmm. only going to benefit people who are motivated to make those healthful choices. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that begs like two questions out of the thing that you just said. How do we decrease that effortful piece and how do we increase the MOs involved? You know, one thing that we were, well, the EO is involved, I suppose, but one thing yeah. we were talking about earlier that I don't think we've really touched on is readily available healthful choices. So it's no secret. And if you look at some of the research, I guess it would be like in a socioeconomic approach. Impoverished areas don't have whole foods. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Impoverished areas don't like have Like the grocery store or just or like whole foods? Oh, uh, yes. I was specifically oh, referencing the... Desserts. Yeah, yeah, but the, the idea of Whole Foods in general, you know, the, these higher end grocery stores aren't in impoverished areas because there's no money flow for them, right? right there's yeah. no s- supply and demand. So if there was a, a documentary not long ago and it was about a, an African American woman showed where she grew up versus 10 minutes away into an affluent neighborhood. And it was every, it was gun store and liquor store and, you know, quickie mart type deal and, you know, saturated fats and billboards for cigarettes and, lottery mm-hmm. tickets. And then she walked like literally four blocks up into the more affluent neighborhood. And there was a Whole Foods and mm-hmm. there was, you know, there wasn't fast food. Like they had a McDonald's and a Taco Bell in her area. And then she walked mm-hmm. up and there was like a, a crazy bowls and wraps and like these organic spots to eat. So, and you look at, you know, however you take that idea, there's data there and the data, however you feel about that personally, you know, setting that aside, looking at it objectively, the data suggests that those that are impoverished have a higher probability of not being satiated in a healthful behavior, mm-hmm. right? So that's one of the things that we want to challenge and tackle too. How do we get this availability to people that don't have that availability? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's one thing that we want to look at because we we have jobs that pay us money to do things, right? And so we're able to maybe not shop at Whole Foods. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's crazy. Whole paycheck. Uh, yeah. The whole, yeah, the whole paycheck, <laughs> right. But we're we're able to have choice in what we buy. Some people aren't. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and some people need these skills that for what they do have. They can make that stretch. What we call balling on a budget. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think you could probably do an entire show just on the scope of even what we're doing. For sure. How do we stay in scope ethically? And, you know, because Clint and I have played around with, you know, ideas of like, do we need to become registered, you know, nutritionists? You know, how far do we need to go? And we have defined our scope and Clint, you can correct me if I'm wrong of just staying in our behavior in a like lane. Of course. And some of this comment I made earlier of there's a lot of systems that we are not going to be able to change. So therefore just like 
you know, within our ethical guidelines that we have to take into account culture and the whole family, the whole individual, the whole client, we have to consider that in, in our research as well, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, we can tell you to, I can even teach you how to shop for vegetables and be able to afford them. But if you don't have a place to go buy them or you only get seasonal vegetables and now that's a whole other layer of things that you have to learn that yeah. is going to probably be harder to motivate you to learn is right. what's in season at all times. You know, that's blueberries. That's a big piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blueberries. They seem to always be around. Um, so, so yeah, no, I, I like that. And going back to this tree, you know, you can kind of pick things out of there that even help us identify and kind of guide us in some new directions for research and make sure that we stay within that scope of, yeah. of treatment. Yeah. So I know we had some other topics in healthful behavior we wanted to discuss, but yeah. before we move on from this article, were there any other treatments that jumped out at you when you were reading it? I know for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, it's one of those great articles that does an amazing oh, summary and then has like five pages of, here's a table of every article related to this topic yeah, you can go look up yourself. <laughs> yeah, Always love those. But w- were there any other intervention ideas worth highlighting now? You know, this is so, so new to our field. You know, we dug super deep into a ton of different articles and, you know, common interventions really haven't been established yet. That's why I love this article is it gives a great framework of places to start for interventions, you know, thinking about choice and breaking down the selection, preparation, consumption piece that uh, within those individual pieces, I mean, Clint and I have, after, I don't know, hours and hours and hours of way too much coffee and talking have just kind of come down to, you know, we can start by thinking of this as a, you know, forgive my lack of behavior analytic words here, but just kind of will and skill of starting to approach this. And by just starting with those two words, be able to divide, you know, is this a motivation thing? And you have all the skills, you know, I can, I've been cooking for 15 years now, but if I, my doctor prescribes me a diet plan and I don't care, (laughs) it's, you know, you can, teach me and throw cooking videos at me all day, it's not going to change my behavior. Mm -hmm. So how do we work with that person versus the person who has all the motivation in the world to change? My stepdad had quadruple bypass heart surgery last year and was given an insane diet to go on. And he was really, really motivated to do it. He had no idea how to do it. He's Mm -hmm. from a town of less than 800 people and thinks that giving up Coca-Cola and going to sweet tea is a better health option, like, (laughs) which is that skill piece, like Mm -hmm. in that knowledge piece, which is why I I really emphasize that focusing on the hows and whys people are doing things versus just what you need to do, being handed a piece of paper and saying, go be healthy. Mm -hmm. So that was a super long way to answer your question of there aren't a ton of common interventions out there yet. Uh, People have played around with a few things, but... We're excited to help be a part of that. I was kind of piggybacking off of that. There, there isn't seminal information in ABA for this re- related thing. You know, branching outside of this is more of an EAB process than it is anything else. I think if I had to find the place that, you know, Behavior Chef and others like us fit, it's not a traditional ABA approach, which I think is what's exciting and also confusing to people because, you know, it's we're, we're really good at one thing and don't mess with that one thing. And just for those of you listening, we're not trying to mess with the one thing. We're trying to give us two things. And so we need <laughs> two more things, things are better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we more need things. all the things. Yeah. People yes. want all the things. So the seminal information isn't really there yet. And what really excites me is reaching outside of our field for research that is done in a single subject design that's been replicable. We can do it again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you know, that we can we can bring it over here and say, okay, these, you know, in the, the dietetics world, they have this type of thing that we don't know about, this XYZ thing that they're using. Like I just did a podcast episode yesterday that I'm editing with a dietitian who uses ACT. How cool is that? That's yeah. cool. Neat. Right? So I didn't know that was a thing. That's my ignorance, but I get to learn that. So mm-hmm. now that I know that there is a marriage between you know looking at someone holistically versus the nutritional piece, that was just out of my, honestly, out of my blatant ignorance for what a nutritionist does. That's why we want to talk to them. And that's why and I did another podcast earlier today to share with the ABA world that it's totally cool that we're interdisciplinary. We have, and I've, I've not been in the field nearly as, as I don't have the tenure that any of you have, but in the short time that I've been around ABA, the last six to eight years, I've noticed we have a proclivity to be loners. And it's really not because we don't have anything to share. It's because we don't know how to play with other people very well. 
Mm. And, uh, and that's just me being blunt. That's Clint's personal opinion. But from what I've noticed, we're not the humble people that we say we are as a collective. And again, I'm not trying to paint a broad brush. It's just the, that seems to be, when I talk to interdisciplinary teams, they're shocked to find out that I want to work with them. And I think yeah. that there's something yep. wrong there. Mm-hmm. So, so that's systemic of, you know, something we're doing needs to change. And I think part of that is if we're moving into other areas that we're not so familiar with, it breeds vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And if we're able to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know the answer, that opens up a lot of questions and a lot of avenues for us to grow as a field, as people, as, you know, as practitioners to be better, get better skill sets. So going outside and looking at other research and seeing how can I apply this to ABA? I love ABA. I has this whole thing now that they're willing to pay you to go to other, other represent ABA yes. at other places. I love I that too. Yeah. It's so wicked. Cool Are you going to another things. conference? Are you going to present ABA at another conference? We'll pay for you. <laughs> Here's to money. Go. Yeah. <laughs> we, will, we will cash flow that. So I, I love that idea that now that's dissemination at its finest, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're not here to tell you that we have the key to, you know, to fix all things. We're here to say we can help. Mm, and yes. if we can tone down that approach as a field, we will grow beyond what well, we won't know what to do with the growth that we see, yeah. especially now with the new released and relaxed schedules to take the exam and everything. So hopefully, oh, yeah, yeah. hopefully that breeds 100%. a lot more practitioners and to breed those practitioners. We need people that are teaching those practitioners to be humble humans. <laughs> And so I, I I don't mean to make this a Greenpeace article, but <laughs> to get outside of our, to answer your question in a long way, way longer than Tony's. I'm better than that. Or better at that than you, Tony. I can talk longer. Uh, just kidding. That That's true though. I can talk forever. So edit this if you want to. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll stay in it. No skin off the nose. <laughs> but if, if we can really use our skill set and don't just apply it to what we know, don't, you know, look, look in a mirror just to look in a mirror. If we can really look at what we can do and broaden that and ask what we don't know versus what we do know, I think ABA's field insurance will end up ultimately paying us more money to do things outside of just ASD and DD populations because the, the research will be there. There's no low boss for health and wellness right now. Mm-hmm. Right. right. There, there is no seminal information that says, oh, they're viable. They can plug into this team. And here's you know double blind studies to prove that. But if there are people out there vulnerable enough to take that step into an uncharted territory, just like our forefathers did, so to speak, who knows what can happen in the next 20, 30 years? Look what happened in the last 20, 30 years. Mm. You know, we could be that next wave. So yeah. let's do oh, something. Oh, yeah. No, I commend you for seeing this opening and hopping on it, right? Because that's precisely how our field is going to grow. And yeah. I think what, you know, part of what holds people back is that they say, well, I need a job. I need to you know, support right. my family and myself. And it's difficult to find behavior analytic jobs that are marketed as such that are going to pay the bills, right? right. Outside yeah. of yeah. ASD, DD, like you're saying. So any of us that can start to foray into those new territories are paving the way for hopefully down the road, those becoming more Sure. Recognized fields yeah, this in is behavior a, analysis. This is real, 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 in reality right now for the two of us. This is just a passionate hobby, right? Right. And yeah. We we have full time jobs Same. and families to take Same. care. Same. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So you know, we're daughter's hand under my bedroom door right now, trying to come. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> now that could be a horror film or a heartwarming <laughs> movie, depending on how you want to spin it. Starting out as heartwarming, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> To bring it into what we're going to talk about, I love that Jesse Dallary has taken on looking at some of these other areas and other yeah. applications of behavior analysis, and he has the platform and, and the, the crew to be able to do that. So mm-hmm. we all should be thinking about the ways we can continue to push the science in the field. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that excitement just with the feedback that we're getting through our Facebook pages. And I mean, even the feedback you all get through through this podcast, I mean, it just opens our minds and our ideas to, to oh yeah, we can... We can we can really expand, and we have enough people in the field, and just access to information in general is so readily available that it, it's super exciting to see where this heads. Yeah, word. Yeah. Word. Sorry to interrupt the interview, but I wanted to stop for one quick second to let all of you listeners know, in case you didn't, that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to our podcast, you are eligible for one learning credit. All you need to do is, well, you know, finish listening to this episode and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs, CEUS. 
And you're going to need a couple pieces of information, though. One of those pieces is a secret code word. We've got two secret code words hidden in this episode. I'm going to give you the first one right now. It is Wendy's, W-E-N-D-Y-S. You don't need the apostrophe. That's fine. Wendy's, you know, like the fast food chain or, you know, if you have a friend named Wendy and they own something, it would be Wendy's, whatever it is they own. You know, Wendy's. I am having a great time talking to our guests from The Behavior Chef. I hope you are too. But unfortunately, we do need to pause for a quick second for a little break. But don't worry. We will be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure. We all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking to Clint and Tony from The Behavior Chef, all about improving healthful behavior. Let's get into that interview again. Here we go. So let's move on to our other article. So we, we've been talking pretty, I don't want to say broadly, but there's so much more talking about, you know, the food, food yeah. consumption. And yeah. even though it seems like there are so many different ways that you have to be mindful of in your intervention about food and preparation and the consumption... There are so many other helpful behaviors that we need to engage in to yes. maintain, you know, our long, happy lives. And I think one of the more common one is the lack of exercise, even the lack mm-hmm. of, you know, moving around, which, you know, especially as podcast people, we, <laughs> it's very <laughs> hard not to do because so much of the day becomes then sitting and recording. But then also <laughs> the idea of, you know, cigarette smoking. And that's still, even though I think, you know, the amount of cigarettes consumed in America has decreased and continued to decrease over the years. I think cigarette-related deaths are still relatively high in the list of preventable reasons for mortality in this country. Sure. So looking for treatment options. And I know the ones that we're going to talk about here relate to the idea of the contingency management procedures. Is contingency management in terms of healthful behavior something that either of you are familiar with in either your practice or is it something you've just mostly seen in the research? It was something that I'd seen mainly in the research. And when you look at contingency management, it's really self-monitoring with another layer. We like to put big terms on stuff, which I think is cool. <laughs> but contingency management, you know, I out of the uh, the the curate and daily article about the increasing the number of steps that are taken, mm-hmm. you know, they did basically like a component analysis with part of that. So I know we'll talk about that as we go, but that was the first one that I really saw that contingency management in and straight from their their methods piece you know, the three basic requirements for contingency management are simply a target behavior that is readily detected, reinforcement, and then contingent withholding of that reinforcement. So it's basically like you need something that you can observe and take data on that's reliable. Mm -hmm. Then you need a DR of some kind. (laughs) Hopefully not an O. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) True. Very true. So it's, it's really those two. It's really a typical, you know, what we would consider for lack of better terminology, kind of a cookie cutter approach. Mm-hmm. It's really, we're, we're defining a behavior and we're defining the consequence strategy. These two articles, they literally used the exact same online platform right. for their contingency <laughs> management. Yeah, they did. And that's what I love about where we are right now is that in, in ASD, you can look at some of the, the really cool articles out of Java that are just so nuts, you know, mm-hmm. concurrent schedules and all these reversal withdrawal designs and these just these really elaborate pieces of data that look like almost artwork. Yeah. And here you have, we made people walk more by giving them stuff for doing stuff. 
that's, yeah. that's right? where we got, that's where we got to. So what I love about <laughs> where we are is like, we get to take those broad ideas and we kind of get to come back to center, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get to come back to the basics of ABA and say, okay, how do I apply that to health, fitness, nutrition? How do I apply that to behaviors that are not directly related to functional replacement behaviors for an ASD kiddo or communication device or whatever it might be? Oh, Hey, these people want to walk more. What mm -hmm. if I incentivize them walking more? Mm -hmm. And how do I incentivize it and make it parsimonious to where, you know, they're not having to do like, I, I don't want to jump ahead. But in one of the articles, I thought it was super, the, the cessation one for smoking, when we get to there, mm -hmm. I thought response effort was way too high for that. I would have just got a vape. <laughs> yeah. I would have just changed my topography mm -hmm. a little bit. You know, I'm getting the same thing, but it's not as bad. Mm -hmm. See, and that's the problem. Our research isn't out there yet to show how bad vaping is. And now we're starting to see that some of the research coming out is like, oh no, it's not as bad for your lungs, but it's just as bad for your body in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's trading apples for oranges, really. The continuously management, the cigarette smoking article was, was 2011. So I've actually, I don't know the proliferation of, you know, vaping as something that people do back then, sure, but it's I know, current. yeah, but I know like I think England, I think they, they see vaping as sort of like their harm reduction technology. You know, if people are vaping while you're right, it's not the same as smoking cessation. So there are still health risks. It's overall of benefit. So sure. is that the next step? And you're right. Is that a less effortful behavior that should be promoted because the net gain is higher? You know, the return, the return of investment is higher than say, okay, everyone, you got to twice a day post your video where you're blowing into your CO monitor and you're yeah. holding it up so everyone can see what it is. And, you know, and, and then thinking about how hard that is. And then the crux of the article being like, well, we know this has worked. What if? We tied in forum posting and yeah. people writing Ooh. nice things like, good job. Like you made your goal. And we, we put in the, the group contingencies. So it wasn't just one person. And then I guess the thought being that over time, once they're like, anyway, we're not paying you to not smoke anymore. So hope the behavior, uh, you know, generalizes <laughs> to the rest of your life and is maintained. But now you've got your online friends who are going to post nice things to you and that's going to do it. It was a little, you know, a little well, tenuous. It was <laughs> very, yeah. very tenuous. <laughs> And I think that, you know, this is the first foray, I mean, mm. not the first foray actually for smoking cessation, but one, you know, one of the few forays into this line of research. So it's more like you're, you're dipping your toes in and saying, look, this can work mm -hmm. versus sure. then being able to come back and say after years of research that, you know, we've done, you know, so many component analyses and these are the pieces that are necessary mm -hmm. in right. this format or in this combination or at this sort of sort of dose. Yep. So we're just not there yet. But I also want to say that my understanding is in the UK that they more closely regulate the amount of nicotine in yes. the vaping products. So right. it's sure. a lot higher here in the US, which is our concern, or not my concern, but like the US's concern is that we're creating more nicotine addicts through vaping who had not previously been cigarette smokers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're just trading one for the other. Right. Yeah. That, that, I think that's a concern yeah. a lot. That's a concern. I know with like the, the opioid epidemic is that sense of, well, sure. you know, a lot of medication treatments can be effective, but again, are we just trading one drug for another? Right. But that, right. you know, behavioral yeah. pharmacology type stuff, you know, right. that. it's very yeah. interesting stuff. Well, I'm not smart enough to know anything about it, but it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. yeah and I think one thing that the two articles kind of left out too, when they're using like the social contingencies of, you know, smoking sensation and increasing walking is the amount of reinforcers or social deprivation or satiation that's occurring outside of the online forum. Right. So mm -hmm. if you have someone that isn't engaging in a lot of social interaction outside of the online forum, it actually may be more reinforcing to walk and to stop smoking in the absence of getting paid. Right. Versus someone that maybe may have a quite satiated social calendar mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so may not find the value of that social reinforcement online as potent. So that might be something too that I think, you know, future research when I was reading that, because I do, I engage in a lot of online challenges mm -hmm. for yeah, exercise. Yeah. I love them, right? But uh, I pay for them too. Mm -hmm. And it is yeah, the money a... that keeps me going, right? I'm like, I don't want to lose my $25. I mm -hmm. love that people are like loving my exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And loving that I stayed underneath my calorie goal. But if I didn't have the $25 there, we tried to do it and it flopped miserably. Um, sure. So you have you have intermittent reinforcement in a couple of different ways there. So yes. You've got, right. Yeah. Right. So you you've got you front loaded it with twenty five bucks. Sure did. 
And then you've got the intermittent piece of yeah. social reinforcers, potential social reinforcers, potential, which we don't even right? know. Yeah, because they may not be social reinforcers. They may actually be over time. They may lose that effect. And as you said, become satiated. Now you've got now you're it's detrimental for you to log in, which right. also makes you lose your 25 bucks. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it could be ver- of like, oh, that person is liking it again. I'm yeah, just kidding. Yeah, I hate them. They're talking <laughs> to me. Like, you know, it's no, obviously not but true. I think, but I think, you know, like the w- one thing that's really interesting and I think sexy about this line of research, right, is that it's so much more complex, right? Because we're dealing mm-hmm. with a holistic approach to a person and you not only have to look at them within the tightly controlled experimental setting, but also how is it going to generalize to their natural, you know, all variables at play mm-hmm. session, right? Because it's not, it's an, Very isn't enough to say, approach. right? Yes. It's not enough to say, oh, I haven't, I didn't smoke in this 20 day challenge, right? But day 21, woo, binge Light smoking, right? That's right. <laughs> or I'm going to watch TV all day but and Jackie, not walk. if you smoke, I won't post my great job in your goal. <laughs> oh, if my smoking doesn't decrease or increases, then you know that I don't care that you post you met your yeah, girls. I mean, right. So right. I think it's 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 something really fascinating to kind of delve into, and it, it's a little more complex. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that really grabs me about this type of research or looking into, you know, advancing the field in this regard is that we, we're dealing with a neurotypical audience for majority of the time. So these tried and true behavioral mechanisms we've got in the DD and AD population, how do those generalize? You know, mm-hmm. so I, obviously the behavior principles are there. But how do we tailor them to a neurotypical audience when we, you know, we, we would use them a little differently in an ASD setting? Mm. You know, typically we're in an educational setting where, you know, we're in a contrived, we're not in a vacuum like most of these, you know, we're applied. We're not, we're, we're not the, the studious side so much. So how do we, cause I'll tell you what, being neurotypical, my life is very much applied. <laughs> it's, you know, there's not many things that I'm like, okay, I know if I do A, B will definitely happen. It's usually like if I do A, B is likely to happen. And that's yeah. the that's, that's the reality. Life, that that's the confounding variable that you cannot plan for is life. Right. It yeah. Happens. And I think I hear what you're saying, and it's like behavior is behavior. Everyone's yeah. behavior operates under the same principles, and it's going to mm-hmm. respond in the same way. But I think one of the main points is less that it's a certain like neurotypical versus neurodiverse population, but the level of control that we have over the environment, right? Yeah, yeah, so right. research that's in an educational setting, by and large, we have a lot more control over the variables at play. True. When you're just out and about in the regular community, everything's a constant concurrent offerance arrangement, right? <laughs> Wendy's, Burger King, McDonald's. Right. <laughs> if I say yes, can I have all <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? Okay, and there's still... Yes, thank you. It's such a different type of control that one might have or really lack of control. Yeah, you you basically, that's a way more poignant way to say what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. So thank you for clearing that up. (laughs) That's exactly what I was getting at. That environmental piece is so different from an educational to a real world, if you will, Mm -hmm. experience. Absolutely. Well, and that goes back to that, you know, of of being able to pull from research and, and other fields that have kind of not so much perfected, but at least have put a ton of research behind environmental control and, and classrooms ha- have done a really good job of that. At the district that I work for, we have teachers are giving a universals checklist, which they, you know, have to have their room at least with the fo- these certain foundations to start to be successful and then individual, individualize it to their, to their groups. And I think there's some really cool stuff that we can pull from there when it comes to setting up your kitchen and setting up your pantries and, you know, working on that response effort on maybe you need to put your cookies on your roof. I don't know because they're just harder to get to <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or send them to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's a really cool piece and that, that we should be looking at, at least in those fields. Yeah. I think going back a little bit to to kind of start looking at some of the contingency management in terms of changing behavior, it, it is sort of nice to feel like I was reading these articles, I felt very much like, wow, these articles are of the now, because if you tried to do this type of research or these types of programs, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, just think how impossible it would have been like, okay, so here's the idea. I'm going to give people who don't smoke, they're going to earn money for not smoking or being below a certain CO level, you know, in, in the breath machine. All right, how, how do we find out their breath machine? We either can't or they have to come twice a day to the hospital that is who right. knows how far away from their house. I mean, that wouldn't even be an option. So it was 
sort of nice to see these as, hey, you could do a lot of this work online and we have more technology that is cheap and readily available to objectively track many of our health behaviors. I mean, I think the wearables, you know, I don't know if it's a fad or if it's going to last forever, but really stems from the idea of everyone wants. Yep. <laughs> I see Clint, you're holding up yours. Yep. Oh, yep, the Jackie's got it. Oh, no. Now we're all yeah. sharing. Oh, yeah. Mine's in a drawer. I think. I Podcasting right there. <laughs> Samsung <laughs> gear is my life. <laughs> it has everything on it, not just my fitness. It's my entire. It's got it all. Oh, good. But oh, yeah, again, it's got it all. the wearables really came from everyone wanting more health information. Mm-hmm. And I think even some of the pieces that you might get. You know, some of the ideas of like, you got to post online and go to the forum. So much of that you could just do from your phone mm-hmm. nowadays. So I have a button on my reality, watch. It. Yeah. yeah. It just goes with that. You could actually say that the phone is a means of setting up contingency management in which we are constantly changing the environment because you're getting your notifications. Right. Yeah. You don't have right. to go anywhere to post. Oh, yeah. So even though I think there were some some downsides to the study here, you know, namely that We don't know if the social interaction had anything to do with any improvements on the overall treatment. And I think with the walking one, the other, the other piece being (laughs) while the incentives were great, you know, just getting feedback seems to also change behavior pretty nicely. They were kind of the same. So we went through all this trouble for this money. And really people just wanted to be included. (laughs) But I think that's the result most policymakers want to hear. Because I mean, how many times have you seen that? Like, we want to increase recycling. We put in this incentive program and recycling was great. And then we got rid of the incentive program because we want people to recycle because it's good. And we want that intrinsic motivation, you know. A lot of solar programs went that way too. Oh, geez. And then, you know, behavior goes, goes downhill and everyone sits there going like, I don't know what happened. People didn't magically change how incentives work. Oh, woe is us. There's nothing we can be, we be can out of do. a job if that magic happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My I think, favorite was that guy who went 25,000 steps in just that one day. Yeah, that was an outlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Was yeah. That, that dude was I, at Epcot or something. That's so what I told yeah. Rob. I was like, I bet he went to Disney World. That's it. They said he was on vacation that day. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I bet he went to Disney World. <laughs> I went to, I went to Dublin it. in October. And I think day two, we ended up getting like 18 or 20,000 steps nice. just walking around the city center of Dublin. So it's, it's quite possible. So maybe but you went to Dublin. That's well, my, my daily, guys. There's no other right. Choices. Yeah. Well, That's my daily. Really? We're not all as... No. <laughs> We're not all under the same kind of contingency management as you. So, you know, we, yeah, that's you might need daily. to teach us. I'm going to get like 30,000 and then it's going to be norm. That's if someone be wants like to my use up. me as a participant in there, just sending people to great tourist destinations that require a lot of walking, <laughs> increase walking program. I, I, you know, I'm I'll in. Yeah, it's up. fully funded. I'm, I'm all in. Right? I'm there. <laughs> Actually, my favorite part of either of these articles was the, the, the lady they didn't use. She was training for a wedding. So she adopted right. a yeah. fitness routine. That was fantastic. And, uh, <laughs> I was like, you know what? She doesn't need you anyway. Yeah. She's, <laughs> she's like, F you guys. That, that right. intrinsic motivation, right. even though for a short time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not necessarily at a delayed discount so much. Oh, no. It's, it's short there. term. You do your training until your wedding day, and then you're out. That's, that's right. right. And, and you you're married. You're and you're married. <laughs> that's first how I, that's what happened to me. I got fat my first year of marriage. I, mean, I gained 40 pounds my first year of marriage. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's It's gone now, but... We ate pizza a lot. We we pizza's ate, good. Oh, it was amazing. Where we have a whole T-shirt dedicated to. It. That's yeah. Do, actually. yeah. Eat pizza, take data. That's one of our. Ooh, that's yeah. good. That's good yeah. slogan. You can do both. You can mm-hmm. eat pizza that's, and take data. It only needs one true. hand for each. So you can right. you can be healthy and eat pizza. That's true. Everything right? in moderation. Everything in moderation. We could do moderation. an entire. There's a whole episode. Devoted. I was going to say. Right. I just I just thought of two different. Today's National Pizza Day, actually. So. Oh. I, I saw I that was, sign. I thought it was an advertising yeah. technique. So yeah, I'm sure I, it I is. I know it is, but of course know, it is. I did. I thought it maybe just that one place. But you know, tying it into the research and talking about choice, you know, wanting to. So I two of my favorite ways to make pizza. I make pizza out of out of cauliflower, or I'll make a pizza crust out of ground chicken. Yeah, that sounds weird and it's delicious. Am, <laughs> it's amazing. It's both. It's yeah. It is. It's it's weird and delicious. You know, it goes back to those pivotal skills. Did you learn them? What's available? What's going to be the most, you know, so like I keep that stuff on hand at home most of the time. So I've got like rice cauliflower. I've got ground chicken in my freezer, in my fridge. So it's really no response ever for me to get, I don't have to get in the car, go get it. I usually have it on hand because that's in my typical repertoire of eating in general. Mm-hmm. So if I've got that on hand and I want a pizza, now the response effort's a lot lower for me to hit a button on Domino's and have it delivered. But that financial loss that I'm trying to keep that I've already paid for and I'm trying not to let freezer burn happen and I'm still trying to be healthy that pushes me to spend the extra 45 minutes and cook a meal. 
Mm -mm. So all of those, we just talk about the real world effect, right? That's the real world effect of concurrent schedules of reinforcement and EOs, AOs, and everything in between. Uh, all for some chicken pizza. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, I hate the preparation so very, very much. Like I love the idea of buying healthy food. I love being able to count. I use that calorie information. I'm one of those folks who yeah. sees it. It's like, you know what? I think I will change my responding and change what I purchase. And I certainly like to eat the food and I'll eat anything, yeah. but I hate making it so much. So again, my intervention, yeah. I mean, I, I'll eat it. I'll eat anything. It's the intervention would need to be for me. It would need to be in the preparation step of like sure. actually you know, pairing, I need my contingency management, you know, how many meals did you cook this week? Yeah. And then someone's got to say something nice to me and yeah. give me my feedback after. Speaking I'll work which, on it. And, and that's what we're, you know, and that's one of the things I'm fascinated with is, Same. is diving into, I don't like this piece. I really hate this piece of dot, dot, dot. And, and diving into, to why is it maybe there is a skill that you didn't, or a tip that you haven't ever heard of that could completely change your mind on that or, Am I never going to be able to change your mind? So I need to give you the lowest response effort possible right. and make it as quick yeah. and painless as possible to make you be able to do it more in the future. So shameless plug, that's the, the entire first episode of Behavior Bites is just about preparation and how to make life easier. Mm, I like that. Yes. So, so hopefully you can do it more because it's and, awesome. And to, first to not, cooking. I think it was, was it you, Jackie, that I, I'm about to throw under the bus? Probably. Yeah, Probably. <laughs> Because we talked in an early, like in November when we first met up about talking about doing this. And I was like, hey, I have an early prototype of a self-monitor. Oh, yeah. I'll send you. And you're like, hey, I'll do it for a week and let you know how it goes. So it must have been so good that you didn't need to report to me. Uh, I don't actually think I did it yet. But if you want me to, I will. I would actually love it if somebody would Nothing because now. I want to tear it apart and make it okay. better. And I, it, it probably yeah. sucks. I'll be honest. All right. So like, full disclosure, I'm one. actually starting a, a challenge tomorrow. So I'll do it. Yay, yeah, please. And, right. and Resend it to me and I'll do it. I will, I will. And then I'll share my results to the audience in our next preview episode. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, yeah. She's going to... So, go. so for throwing her under the bus on this episode, I'm going to be publicly torn apart with my, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> for my protocol. <laughs> I, right. I gained 40 one. pounds in the week that I used that protocol. <laughs> but the one thing I really want to know, because I created it to be disseminated away from us into typical... When I say typical non ABA folks. Non ABA mm-hmm. folks. Yeah. So it's it's got a whole thing attached to it that discusses antecedent and consequence strategies that you can do in the real world. And it's got a tracking thing, and it's got daily and weekly reinforcers attached, and it's one right. sheet. So okay. I tried. Uh, please tear it apart. I really want to. I spent time on this, and I really want to make this thing worthwhile. So you guys are smarter than I am. I'll kill it I apart. I'll kill it. Do it. You stab it until do it. Stab in no, the I'll eye and cry. Kill it. Yeah. There you go. What's, that old sports saying, you stab them in the eye and stab them in the brain until they're dead or something like that. <laughs> right. Defeat your enemy. Yeah. So do oh, that okay. to my protocol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're getting to a good point where it's hard not to talk about sharing this information with the world with, right. the, with the articles because they're so broad and there's so many yeah. things we really want to hit. But why don't we kind of sum it all up and move into dissemination station? <laughs> Dissemination station, station, station. <laughs> Got all the Hello. everyone. Do your sound effects. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's the OG sound effect. So you know, we talked about three very different types of healthful behavior. We talked about food intake of food and healthy food. We talked about cessation of unhealthy behaviors in, in the form of smoking, and we talked about trying to you know using some techniques to increase our our movement or some some other health, healthful behavior in terms of you know getting up off our cans and moving around. So, I mean, in general, since you guys are spending so much of your free time now looking at this research, what's the what's the overall direction of the work in terms of improving human health and improving human healthful behaviors? Man, that's a, that, <laughs> I know we're talking specifics, but that's a broad question in and of itself. Hey um, there, it is. No, not not for you. I just mean like, it's, it's so hard to answer that question. But yep. I did say in my, because in, in response to that, I said, I can sort of, in a word, the, the direction of, of where we're going is simplicity. I kind of touched on it earlier that we don't really have much yet as far as ABA is related mm-hmm. to these types of interventions. You know, the, the article that Tony spent time researching had that decision tree and, and those types of things. Those are so cool, piece, such a cool piece, but it's, it's so basic in, in that it's new, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't have yeah. the seminal research in there just yet. And so right now, I think what we have to our advantage is simplicity. You know, the majority of those health choices 
those I just said the the research that's there is it's outside of our scope so much. Mm-hmm. So I think the 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 question that we've got to ask so much is how can we manipulate the environment in a way that denotes long term behavior change? Mm-hmm. And well, that's, I think you know, it's a good place to to piggyback off that simplicity. I think the yeah. like that we're talking about is flexibility because yep. we talked about earlier about the you know how if you think of the word diet or you think of health and wellness that you think of some kind of some absolutes like I have to right. do this, I mm. have to eat this, I can't do this. And I can never have Starbucks again. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, you're not a Sith, right? Or <laughs> if you know, if you go to work and you have everything prepped for the week because you love prepping now, and all of a sudden it's Susie's birthday and somebody brings a chocolate cake. That then you find me binge eating in the corner. Right. <laughs> or Susie. You set yourself up with an intervention that allows you to say, you know what? It's Susie's birthday. It's okay if I have a piece of cake. I shouldn't have three pieces of cake. But if I have a piece of cake, then I'm I'm going to have the dinner that I usually have that's healthy and, and maintain all of everything outside of that. And that's okay. And that flexibility piece is really what we're talking about is generalization mm-hmm. of, of this knowledge and making sure that we don't, create interventions even within our own science going into this that follows that straight hard edge that people don't think that they can wiggle in and out of. Mm. And we do that with that kind of that act piece that we've really, really been kind of diving into this past year Mm -hmm. of values. And if you are more value focused on what you want to do and where you want to end up, allows you a lot more to understand why you're doing it, how you're doing it, instead of just the hard line of, I have to eat kale tonight. Mm. It'd be so sad every day. Yeah. (laughs) So in terms of kind of looking at follow-up and sort of where, where our field is going and, and kind of yes. building on our, our kind of simple starting research, what are the barriers that you would see? I mean, in terms of looking at other research that's going on or just thinking about improving healthful behavior barriers. I mean, I, I know the two of the articles we talked about today, the barriers were, how do we get this objective information? And, and Technology can help to some extent, but I, I, I hate to say, well, technology will solve all these problems. There are no more barriers to this yeah. research. I mean, are there other things that jump out as this is going to be a problem in getting these answers? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. I think, you know, Clint and I have just kind of decided that, you know, we're just starting with the super foundational, simple questions. I mean, I'll just take the cooking side for, for instance, of just starting with simple surveys of just we have these assumptions that people either don't like to cook or they don't have time to cook. But maybe that's not true. Maybe there are three other variables that we're not thinking of. Mm-hmm. So we have to gather that information from the people that we want to come to us to for intervention. So starting with simple questionnaires, simple surveys, and then taking that information and, and building upon that and then building upon that next article, so on and so forth. Because I, I have a, I'm really interested in, to see how function works with in the nutrition world and environmental factors. And we've kind of put together some matrices on what we think might be the you know reasons that people stop a wellness plan, but we don't know that until we really get the foundational stuff. And I think Clint, you have some ideas for that too. I do piggyback off of, uh, off of that piece. I, I've really been toying with the idea of ratio strain. So, you know, you've got, you've got motivation, but for how long you've got reinforcement, but for, how how long does that one reinforcer stay reinforcing? So I I find it funny in, in school, I didn't realize that we didn't have preference assessments like formally in ABA to like 1985, which was, it was bonkers to me. We had the single stimulus, you know, reinforcer protocol coming 1984, 1985, somewhere around there. And I thought, so what do we do for like 20 years? Do we, <laughs> did we just like throw spaghetti at a wall? I'm like, you know what? That looks like it works. You know, it's stuck and it's, it's staying. And so it's the same thing with, you know, we talked about all these moving variables and stuff just a few minutes ago. It's, that's that same thing. How do we continually scientifically look at ratio strain? Because it's going to be, it's going to vary every single day. Again, we're not in a vacuum. We're not, it's going to vary second by second. So we're looking at ways that we can do that. But to answer the question in, in three really quick, simple ways, there's, a, I've been saying it this whole time, the lack of seminal research is a barrier. It's a relatively new area for us. The need the absolute necessity and need for collaboration for other disciplines. So one of the ideas for the behavior chef is to be able to show our viability outside of what we typically do without the need for BCBA to have any other letters. Well, to do that, we need to bring in RDs, dietitians. We need to bring in MDs, doctors. We need to bring in people that have those other letters to show that, listen, I don't need to know caloric intake. I don't need to, I'm not prescribing you a diet. What I'm here to do is help you break down the whys and hows to get past what the doctor's already given you, right? The, the mm-hmm. qualified person's already given you the prescription. I'm here to help you with prescription fulfillment, to use our 
our terminology for mm -hmm. uh, uh, billing purposes. And then the third one for me is we need randomized trials for that second one to be a thing. We, we got to do the blind studies. We, we got to have that low Vossian approach to, you know, there's a reason why insurance pays us money for what we do. Somebody went out there and said, hey, here's proof. So we, it all comes back to the seminal articles we need. We need to do the research and we need to show that, you know, this is how we can push ABA past. So we need more people. We need yeah. more people like us. Not like us, because I'm super weird, but we need like, <laughs> we don't need more Clint's, one's enough. But we need more, we need more people that love ABA and, and want to see ABA disseminated yeah. um, past the walls of what we've already got. We need to open the borders of our little pond and go into a lake and then go into a river and then go into right. an ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I think we need both, right? We, we still need yeah. the single subject design. We still yep. need to show that things can immediately show change in an individual without having you know, looking at the group design, because sometimes we lose with that variability there, right? Sure. <laughs> but I think it's not an or, it's an and. So I think we yeah. need the single subject design and we need that broader, bigger group design research yeah. to further prove our point. But I think that's not where we start, right? Nope. I think we, we still make it need robust. to start. Yeah, yeah. I still, we need to start at our level, at our, you know, where our competence lies. That's is right. That in that single Go subject design, see some replication, because to be quite fair, they're, you know, traditional psychologists are having what they would term a replication crisis, right? That all of their basic research and theories are unable to be replicated. I mean, this is something that is troubling for many psychologists now. And, yeah. you know, when I, when I talk with them and chat with them, they're like, do you have this problem? And I'm like, actually, no, yeah, that's why I, we don't, I have don't. That yeah, I right. don't have that problem. I'm not having this crisis that you're having because the research that we do you know, is with a few people, but we can see that variability and figure out why that variability is present. And yeah. that helps us expand the boundaries of our treatments. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Going off sort of what you were talking a little bit about, Clint, the idea of as individual practitioners, we need help from other individual practitioners. <laughs> Looking into, you know, widespread dissemination of information, do you think there's a role or, and if so, what role for, governmental bodies or even big business to take in affecting widespread behavior change. Cause I, I know certainly looking at the Goodness. talking about selection behavior yeah. in terms of the food, there's no way this gets done without businesses selling this stuff. Say, you know what? We actually care more about our consumers living longer to keep purchasing our product. Yes. than taking the quick buck of like, no, 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 this is, these Cheetos are healthy. Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> they don't big. leave things on your hand. That yeah. means they're right. healthy. But that's yeah. generally what we're seeing, though, isn't it? We're seeing Cheetos that are all natural. Cauliflower Cheetos. Yeah. The we're cauliflower seeing... puffs are delicious. They, yeah. Pirate's Booty is one of my favorites. The thing yeah. is mm -hmm. so yeah. good. But even within the Doritos, right? Look, let's look at Doritos. They, they have organic Doritos now. They have Doritos that don't have any artificial coloring to them. Mm -hmm. But their nutrition facts are no better. Yeah. It's just a marketing ploy. Opinion. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Opinion piece. It trickles down from big business because you end up hitting... Actually, it trickles down from governmental agencies. Tony, I'm sure you, you could talk about this too, but you talked about it earlier. How many times in our lifetime alone, in 1995, cottage cheese was a source of protein. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, and I, I is always Is it not anymore? It. No, it still is, but it okay, was- Okay, good. I was like, Jew, I've been eating cottage yeah, cheese. Right. But it was yeah. marketed as a health food. It's not a health food. It's a food that has benefits to it. You know, pork got- when, A portion when, of, not, not, not a- Exactly. Right. Not the whole. So when in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, you had pork, the other white meat, right? Mm -hmm. That was a campaign that went along with the decline in red meat sales and the incline in poultry because the dietary industry was saying red meat bad, white meat good. So mm -hmm. to keep the sales up, they switched the pork. So it comes, it's, it's a trickle down effect. At the end of the day, it's yeah. up to the individual, unfortunately. So because my fellow I'll, '90s kids remember snack wells when they yeah came, oh uh, yeah yep, snack yep. wells cookies oh yep those are those are the healthy option and you can eat as many of those as you want which, and I did now, yeah, who didn't you my mom go. died by those things <laughs> so yeah you could go check out like right now if you if you turn on Netflix turn on Netflix right now and look at Game Changers it's a documentary about how the meat industry is terrible and how veganism is the saving grace of the future now I can't speak to either of those things being true or not. But that information is out there. And then there's information 
I, I believe in the same category on Netflix where there are, there are categories about the carnivore diet, which says all you need to eat to sustain your life, right, is nothing but red meat because you can get all of your nutrients from there. So there is there is no wider of a spectrum than those two documentaries for one another for health. So if and I'm then, a, yeah, and then you can listen to then you can watch Goop. Oh, right. Geez. Oh, <laughs> the, the Goop. Lab. So what you can really do is you can come listen to people like the Behavior Chef podcast who have <laughs> experts in the field and have no actual biases to discuss right. these th- things with you. It's shameless plug. <laughs> it's all good. But the, the big business piece, yeah, it, it will be some sort of driving force. We're not sure how and where though, but you <laughs> no. did mention health organizations and those governmental bodies. And I think our first intention is to just show that viability that when combined with other disciplines, such as nutritionists or you know, getting a prescription diet per se from a doctor, that then they would go, the doctor would then say, you know, just like receiving you know, anxiety or depression medication, most of the time they say, okay, now you need to go see this type of therapist or this psychiatrist that they say, okay, now that you have this nutrition plan, you need to go see a behavior analyst. They're going to, you know, right. who specializes in this field and they are going to help you with the environmental and behavioral components to this to help you understand what your current behaviors are, what you need to change and how you're going to change it. You know, yeah. just to, you I know, would call you. Yeah, systematic desensitization. Like that's yeah. a big piece. Let's mean, like, drive together past Starbucks and you yeah. not stop, right? <laughs> last, last April, I ended up having emergency back surgery, and I went from lifting weights every day and being the, you know, fittest I've ever been to knowing that the next 12, 12 weeks of my life I can't move. Mm. And my doctor's like keto diet. You know, and this is my doctor prescribed and ran blood tests and all this stuff. So I knew what it was just, you know, being as involved with food as I am, but I didn't know how to start. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was going to do to my body, what I was going to go through. And being the nerd that I am, of course, I researched all of it, but that's not right. everybody. Yeah. Um, right. So it was a huge impact in my diet. Now, for some, you need to really, you know, ease somebody into that diet. I took, of course, baseline data because that's what I do on my own diet and went from 130, 140 grams of carbs a day just because of the weights and the activity I was doing. And I had to go down to less than 20. Like that's a shock to your system. And if you don't understand what's going on, you're going to think that this you're doing something completely wrong. And, and you're going to be sad. I would have killed so someone. So sad. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, whether it's that or the way. opposite, you know, my stepdad going on the Pritikin diet, which is a no salt, low fat, very bland, crazy diet after coming off his history of food, you know, there was actually a class component after his surgery that he had to attend to learn how to ease himself onto this diet. So he knew what to expect and could do it correctly. And that's very rare. Yeah. That's at one particular hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas. And that's what we need to look at as well and, and take into account. And when you do that, these health organizations, these governmental bodies catch on. It legitimizes what we're doing with these other disciplines because we can't do it by ourselves, and which helps us with insurance, which then helps us broaden our audience and the people who we can bring into clinics and actually make this a viable career, which then has the research behind it. And then we get big business involved in helping hopefully promote healthier, hopefully healthier products, help healthier right. information out there. I mean, even right. the food pyramid from, you know, the mid seventies <laughs> that came out was the most upside down pyramid yeah. ever, ever created. It's terrible. <laughs> and hopefully we can be a part of fine tuning that along the way. And maybe 40 years from now, they think we're crazy, but right now, you know, hopefully right. we can make a, a positive impact. And that's, that's where I think that's the order that those things are going to have to happen yeah. for this to really become big. Yeah, I agree. And I think the more that our field is seen as outside of just working with, you know, the population of autism in DD, I yeah. think there's going to be some more embrace of us being in those fields, working alongside other fields. Like we can't claim to know anything about nutrition or like how the anatomy of the b- internal body works, right? With organs and your heart, like unless you're a doctor or, you know, you specialize in that, we wouldn't know ne- that necessarily, but we know how to change behavior, right? So paired yes. together, we make an amazing team. Yes, right? absolutely. I think you're, you're inside of our brains because when we, this first yes. started, it hit so hard and so fast and so many people were sending us emails and asking, asking questions that, I mean, we were like, oh, okay, so we, now we need to get this certification. I got to go back to this, get this school. Right. And we can combine all these things. And what if it looked like this? And then finally, at one point, we just... You're like, we don't it, need to do it all was, that. It was, a, it was a vacation. I went I went on vacation. Clint went to Ireland and we kind of cleared our heads and came back and like, okay, let's talk about scope. Yeah. This is what we're good at. We're good at behavior change. This is what we love to do. 
and we both have the same passion about collaboration right. and that nothing can be done, you know, in a, without the help of other disciplines and right. we're working in education with IEP teams. You, you I, I really get that ingrained in me. Me too. Yeah. Working with same. OTs, PTs, SLPs, all, all the acronyms. But I mean, uh, it is happening places. So even like yeah, you think about like my, my pediatrician's office, like they partner with other specialties, right? So if you have an issue yeah. and you have like a nutrition issue, they, they don't have like a dietitian mm-hmm. on staff, yeah. right? They I, don't have like a sleep expert on staff, but they're like, here's yes. one, someone that can help you with these. My seven-year-old son lives with Prader-Willi syndrome and he has, I think the most he had at one point was 13 different doctors. Right. Um, we're down wow. to a lot less than that now. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and without... You know, if one of those people tried to do everything, he wouldn't be as successful right. and as healthy as he is now. Absolutely. From education, it crossing over with medical experts, even sure to make sure that he has that he's seen as a, a whole person. Yes. Right. And and we and which is why it's so incredibly ingrained in me is mostly him of just we we have to take that approach, especially with nutrition and health, mm-hmm. or we're going to be no different than organic Doritos. Right. But you know what? <laughs> I love the idea. I think it's just such yes. like, if you're going to eat Doritos, just eat Doritos, right? Just go for it. Like if yes. you're going to have a soda, just have a soda. Mm, Who cares Susie's if it's cane cake. sugar yeah, or regular sugar? It's just still it. sugar. It's, yes, if you're going to do it, it, I mean, just yeah. go for it yeah. and That's then a, start yeah. over. You Your spoke about care. Oh, earlier. You made the Jackie. I think you made the quip. You know, let's let's drive past Starbucks and, and not stop. Right. And one thing I'd love to do with that, you know, if we're looking at that kind of a behavior, is drive past Starbucks, stop at Starbucks, choose something different. Oh, you know, that's and right. so I know, right? Choice. <laughs> that's that's one thing that I would I would love to see our stuff do is like mm-hmm. we don't want to be restrictive, right? right. We want to be flexible. Now, I, I, ironically enough, I personally, opinionatedly, me, Clint, follows intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. I, I do eat in windows. The reason I do that is because I can be flexible. Right. I know that one day I'm going to hit my goal. The next day, there's a birthday party at work. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm not going to be able to... Social obligations are there. So if my window starts at noon, but everybody's getting together at 11, I'm going to eat at 11 that day. I'm not sold to the idea. To me, it's just a nice guiding factor that helps me in my caloric restriction. It helps me stay on track. That's all it is. Yeah. That's been a lot of self respect. You know, being the one of the behavior chef guys, I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been trying to put these things into practice in my own life. So I have that flexibility. Yeah. We want to bring other people that kind of flexibility that you can, you said, you can have it. You don't have to worry about a piece of cake. It's just a piece of cake. It's flour, eggs, and deliciousness. Yes. It's heaven in your mouth. Go ahead and, and enjoy it. Have fun with it. Right back on the train and you're going to be fine. Right. Yep. Throw so, out the kale because that's terrible. I <laughs> actually love kale. <laughs> I do but, too. Oh. But if you think about it, so bringing this up. So in your opinion, what do you think one thing that listeners could do right now to help themselves be more healthful? Sure. I, I spoke about a way we've been talking. You, you guys have let us talk way too long. <laughs> I said it a long time ago, having a long-term goal and a short-term goal. Love um, it. Together. Uh, a That's mixture, measurable, right? Yep. A mixture of delayed reinforcement with continuous reinforcement can be a very effective tool. That's what got me back in the gym eight yeah. month, or nine months ago. I didn't want to go back. I'm sure everybody falls off the wagon and becomes aversive for whatever reason. Socially, you go back you're, you know, in your own mind. So I went back and said, 10 minutes a day of cardio got me a shake at the gym shake place. I did that for a week continuously. And if I did it three days out of five, regardless of how often I went, I was able to go Friday night and go crazy, eat whatever I wanted. I did that for a couple of weeks. And then I increased, you know, I, I increased my activity level, still kept the same routine. Here I am nine months later. I'm in the gym six days a week on average. I do an hour and a half of weights. Or I, do a, I do an hour of weights, hour of cardio every day. And I still, every single day, get a shake. I break my fast, my intermittent fast. I break it at, at my window opening. My window opening is the time that I pair with my shake. So that's still reinforcing for me. I still, and I have choices there. And then Friday night is my uh, quote, for me, the, the term I'm going to use is my cheat night, which isn't, you know, it doesn't denote my contingency being afraid of eating, but it's, mm. it's my night of freedom. And I use that night not only as a re- as an NCR protocol for myself, but it's a date night for me and my wife. Yeah. So it's, it's got its own GCSR involved. I like so it. I'm setting up my own reinforcing protocols naturally. Right. 
And for people, I think for other people too, it's helpful to have buy-in from other people, right? Because we know that we actually can't time. reinforce ourselves in, right. in that sense, right? So even if I yeah. say, oh, I'm only going to get my Starbucks on Friday if I work out, I can stop at Starbucks on Tuesday. Thank you. I can stop at Starbucks on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. I'm like, but it's, I got up. That's like right. my life right now. Yeah. Right. So I think it's good that it works, but sometimes it's not going to work. So having more outside contingencies to support your personal goal, I think will help people stay on track. Right. Yeah. So I bet your wife does yeah. a lot of that for you. Right. So if you're like, I don't yeah. want to go to the gym, she's like, you got to go to the gym, dude. The text message from her, like, hey, you got this. That's a motivator. That's an NSE right. strategy in and of itself right yep. there. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> and the fact that I have a packed bag every morning in my trunk. Right. Um, yep. I've go. got no excuse. So. You know, there you go. That's on me, nobody else. Right. <laughs> Tony, how about you? Any single... mine's a little, yeah, yeah, mine's a little more broad, but uh, and I'm going to stick with cooking since that's my passion and my piece of this is that if if cooking and prepping food is really something that's if like your big barrier from keeping you from meeting your health and wellness goals, I challenge you to no matter what, whether it's you know a huge unhealthy pizza or you want to try to make a salad, like cook something that you are excited to eat. And as you're going through that process, be mindful of what, what part of it that you don't, don't like. What I, was it prepping it all at the beginning? Was it lining it all up? Was it putting it in the pan and, and having to stand over it and wait for it to, you know, or, you know, what, what part of that system do you not care for? And if you're cooking your most reinforcing food that you absolutely love to eat and that one piece you really don't like, then, I really challenge, challenge you to be mindful of, is it a skill piece? Do I need to increase the skill? Do I just not know how to do it? And that's why it's frustrating. And that's why it takes so long. And if not, if you know how to do it, then find an easier way to do it, which again is, is super broad, but get away from the mindset of, I have to now cook everything this particular way and take all of these steps to do it. That there are so many healthy options, every, you know, from the freezer section to the fresh food section now that give you the options to, to have everything that you want. Don't limit yourself. We've talked about flexibility so much. I don't want to dive all the way back into it, but that really is my, my takeaway right now is learn to start challenging yourself to be flexible in what it means to stay within your health goals. Oh, excellent. Ooh, that was good. So Clinton, Tony, thank you so much for coming on tonight and talking Thanks about healthful us. behavior. So we got behavior chef, behavioral bites. Where can everyone find these things if they, if they want to learn more about this topic? Okay. So We've got <laughs> www.behaviorchef.com. That's like our central hub. And it's got links to the podcast, the Behavior Chef podcast. Any major podcast place, just type in the Behavior Chef. You'll see a, a weird yellow thing with my name on it. You can listen to it there. Facebook at the Behavior Chef, Instagram at the Behavior Chef. If you're in ABA, please come over and join Behavior and let's get fed. And so if the three of you aren't in there by the time this is done, I'm going to call you back. <laughs> but, uh, no, if you're interested in working on, you know, just if you're interested in like nutritional stuff in general and ABA, come on over. Yep. It's really cool. So I think we're on every podcast. Oh, yes, we are. There is. Mm -hmm. And at ABAI, I know Tony's going to talk about the behavior bites, but at ABAI, 11 to 11.50 on Monday, May 25th, we have a symposium at the Marriott Marquis level M4 Independence D, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're under Maggie Pavone, but our title, Everyone Eats Behavior Analysis Applied to Eating and Meal-Related Behaviors. It's going to be fun. It's going to be new. I think it's the, the title is going to grab some people, but I'd love to have you come over and meet us, man. And, yeah. Uh, just awesome. yeah. I can't wait to with us. Buddy. Oh yeah. I'd rather go to everybody eats than everybody poops. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're, oh, sorry. I was thinking channeling family guy right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> and you're channeling Sesame street. That's true. Oh, yeah. That's right. You guys remember yeah, that? Yeah, that's true. It that's might be a little true, more family but, yeah. friendly. <laughs> Not the symposium. I prefer eating. I love that's like that's one of my favorite Sesame street songs. Now what about behavior bites, Tony? Behavior bites, uh, head over to behavior chef, YouTube page, subscribe. There's two trailers on there. Now I'll give you a little bit of a background <laughs> about what we're, what I'm planning. And our first episode will be dropping hopefully this spring. I've been working tirelessly on kind of not perfecting, but at least getting a format that uh, you're going to want to watch. So <laughs> um, again, looking for that balance to where behavior analysts and everybody else will, will come and walk away with a different way of thinking about cooking and hopefully be a little bit more excited about cooking. 
Excellent. I'm like super yeah. jazzed, by the way. That's Sweet. good. I'm, I'm going to watch all going. of your videos a thousand that seems, times. That, yeah, good. That seems fun. I hope so. No, nope. there, there is a, there is one teaser trailer up right now. Everybody, I saw it. I was just yeah. looking at yeah. it. The only one there. There should be two. Your oh, pictures. Well. You the second one up. Oh, I, I haven't seen the second one yet. Yeah. So go check out the second one too. I saw the the cut, the edit, the rough edit. It was awesome. So I'm excited to yes. see the finished piece. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Excellent. All right, everyone. Before we finish up, I want to make sure you get that second secret code word, and it is kale k-a-l-e it's a leafy green it's a lot like spinach we talked about it a bit on the episode if you have not had like kale chips especially if they're homemade with some nice seasoning mm, beautiful not that i make them that's a that's a diana thing i just eat them kale once again we want to give a big big thank you to clinton tony from the behavior chef for coming on the show and talking about improving healthful behavior it was a great treat to have them both on to talk about these articles and to share these articles with all of you so thank you once again we hope you really enjoyed listening to aba inside track if you did why not think about subscribing to us we're on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher or really anywhere you get your podcasts you can also feel free to leave us a review on any of those platforms or in any of the other areas you can contact us we're on social media as aba inside Inside Track. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. All these episodes get posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. Of course, you can go to the website, abainsidetrack.com, to get these episodes as well as to find links to the articles that we discussed. And certainly feel free to email us at any time with ideas, recommendations, or just to say hi at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Thank you so much again to our guests. Thank you, Jackie and Diana. Thanks to Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music. Thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for our intro and outro music. And thanks to Hollis Irvin from the Sycamore Workshop for our graphics. And thanks to Daniel Thabit for editing from Liquid Studios Podcast Editing Studio. We'll be back next week with another full-length research-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye!